Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming on a sort of a wet and windy evening for this fantastic evening we're going to get with Adrian Goldsworthy. So firstly, I want to talk uh, very briefly about who our sponsor is tonight. Uh, this is the Feros Foundation. So today's event is sponsored by the Feros Foundation, which is an independent institution founded in Oxford in 2023 to support excellent research in neglected and underfunded subjects, provide an engaging programme of public education and bring the world's best minds to Oxford clearly here tonight, um, to discuss difficult sub subjects and fascinating ideas. Well, it's not going to be difficult tonight, is it, Adrian? It's going to be, but it will be absolutely fascinating. Um, I want to thank Patrick Nash for organising tonight's events and doing all the hard work. My name, I'm your host tonight. I'm Dr. Simon Elliott, FSA. I'm a historian, archaeologist and broadcaster. Um, but principally, we're here to celebrate Adrian's new book, which is the Eagle and the Lion, which talks about the relationship between the world of Rome, the world of the Parthians and the Persians, and the unwinnable war, the unwinnable war between the two of them, which in many ways sort of like plays out throughout history from that point onwards. So we're going to have a fascinating talk tonight. Um, uh, we're going to talk, Adrian's going to talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll take questions. I'll probably ask the first question or two to get things going, and then we'll take questions through to about 6.30, so it's going to be very relaxed and very informative. So very briefly, I just want to introduce Adrian. So I hope you're not shy, Adrian. <laughs> um, so Adrian is an award-winning and best-selling uh, historian and historical fiction writer and broadcaster. Uh, he's one of the world's leading specialists on the Roman military. And I've been telling Adrian um, earlier that actually I still use one of his books written tw uh, published 20 years ago, The Complete Roman Army, still on sale in every Waterstones you go to, as one of my main references, which is the best place to go when you need a catch-all for everything to do with the Roman military. And more recently, he's had uh, highly successful books published, Philip and Alexander, and I was again telling Adrian, my wife Sara is here, our son's called Alexander, so it's very close to our own heart, and on Pax Romana about the, the Roman Empire, and biographies of Augustus and Antony and Cleopatra and Caesar. But also, Adrian is an accomplished historical fiction writer with his Roman Britain series, and most recently he's got the book. Is the war coming out? Is it out or coming out? It's out in hardback, paperback is next month. There you go. So uh, The Wall, which is the most recent one of Adrian's Roman Britain series, and also he's written a series on the Napoleonic Wars. And then next April, uh, top secret, but I can tell you, Adrian tells me he's got his first book about World War II coming out which is about the Normandy campaign as well. So, uh, so Adrian is now going to speak for about 45 minutes on Rome and Persia. Well, many, many thanks, and uh, again, to Echo Simon for coming out this evening. It's, um, I'm slightly surprised. While I was coming from the train station today, it, it suddenly struck me it's 30 years, bar a couple of weeks, from when I submitted my DPhil thesis here back in 93, and Oxford still, so much of it's exactly the same, and then you walk around a corner and either there's a completely different building or something just isn't there. I, I've just finally, I think, this is the first time I've been here for a few years, I'm no longer looking for all the people I knew, which is something, because the place doesn't change so much, I find you come back and you expect them to be there, because much as you remember the place, you tend to remember the people even more. Anyway, onto the subject for this evening. And if I glance down here all the time, it's because my watch is there and I'm terrible at timekeeping otherwise. And one of the problems is that I'm trying to talk about a book that's best part of 190,000 words long and covers seven and a half centuries of history. So this is quite a big topic and it is something it's impossible to explain it all in 45 minutes. So it covers lots of ground. But... I came at this really on the basis that I'm a Romanist by training, and most of us, whether probably a mixture here of people who are formally studying and others who are just enthusiasts, where most people have an idea of what the Roman Empire was. Now, depending on your level of knowledge, that idea might be um, less accurate or more accurate, or for most of us who spend our lives studying it, as we're studying anything else in the ancient world, you realize how little you really know the more you go on and how all the things you thought were certain actually are a lot more um, nuanced, confusing, or perhaps just plain wrong. Um, but we know about Rome. We know about the success of the Roman Empire. We know that the Romans were here in Britain. We know that they were out bordering the Sahara Desert. We know they're on the Rhine, the Danube, beyond Euphrates. This was a very large empire that lasted for an extraordinarily long time. 
And most of that time, after the destruction of states like Carthage and then the Macedonian Kingdom, the Seleucids, the absorption of Ptolemaic Egypt, the Romans were not really in contact with large, organized states of any sort. Not in direct contact. I mean, they knew very, very dimly that China was there, but it was too far away for there to be much meaningful contact. The only exception to this is, from the Romans' point of view, on their eastern borders, where you have an empire that is not quite as big as the Roman Empire in terms of geographical size and particularly in terms of population, but it is sophisticated, successful, advanced, centralized, and it's powerful. And this is, of course, the empire of initially Arsacid Parthia and then the Sasanian dynasty of Persia. And the Romans first make contact with the Parthians in the 90s BC. Something that will come as a theme again and again when we look at this topic is that we can't actually say in which year. We happen to know that it's under Sulla, who will later go on to be the first man to turn his legions and march on Rome, the first military dictator rather than a dictator as a, a temporary official for an emergency situation to, or to preside over elections and the like. We probably only hear about it because Sulla is the man involved. And the story we get is typical of many of the distortions in that Sulla is supposed to be um, approached by an envoy from the Parthian king of kings. He's also got um, the king of Cappadocia with him. And according to Plutarch, our main source for this, Sulla causes offence to the Parthian envoy because he sits on a chair in the middle and he puts the king one side and the envoy the other side. Now, quite how you arrange three chairs to make everybody equal, I'm not sure anyway. And this is probably typical Roman propaganda. There's plenty of people who don't like Sulla, so you're going back home and there's a tradition that this is an insult. And then you get the tradition that the Parthian, when he goes back to the royal court, is executed because he's allowed the empire to be humiliated in this way, which is probably, again, part of this tradition you've got deeply embedded in the Greco-Roman um, ideas that all kings, and particularly monarchs of Eastern empires, were cruel and capricious and went around executing their people. The odds are Plutarch doesn't know what's going on, if he knew at all what happened to this man afterwards. We have no other sources for this incident. We have nothing from the Parthian side, and therefore we're looking at it from the Greco-Roman point of view. Now, that's a problem all the way through, and I'll, I'll come on to sources in a minute, but let's just justify what I'm doing. Because in this book, I treat the Sasanian Persians who appear in the third century AD, first of all with Adashir and then Shapur the first, and then rule right the way through for the best part of 400 years. Now they succeed the Parthian Arsacid family that have originally supposedly begun from uh, nomad warlords coming from the, the northeast from beyond the empire. They're not properly Aryan, Iranian. Though, again, that's a lot more complicated than you might think. And they've also been around for 400 years. Between them, these two dynasties rule for over eight centuries. And for a very large part of that time, they control most of this empire that stretches to what's now Pakistan, Afghanistan, that area. It's stretching down to the Gulf. It's in the Euphrates and Tigris valleys. It's going into Armenia. It's going up to the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea. This is a huge, huge area, and while there are periods where some regions will be in rebellion, on the whole, this is very coherent. Now, the Sasanians are a group that rebel from within the empire. Their heartland is in what would now be Iran, um, and they speak a different language. They have a different tradition within the broader Zoroastrian tradition of religion. There is a tendency amongst many scholars to treat them as completely separate. And what you will find is that books look at the Sasanians and they look at the Parthians, as if there's no connection. Now, there's lots of reasons why this is misleading. Now, it's very convenient for Romanists, because if you think about Roman history in the third century AD, if you're judging things on how well everything's going, this is not a great time for the Roman Empire. It's no longer fashionable, perhaps, to talk about the third century crisis, but this is a time when the Romans go through a lot of emperors and nearly all of them die violently. And you've got, you know, Decius, who managed to get himself killed by the Goths. 
You've got Valerian who managed to get himself captured by the Sasanian Persians. Claudius Gothicus dies of plague. Other than that, everybody is either killed by other Romans or commits suicide as a result of other Romans having a go at you. So it's not, not a time of stability and success. And the Roman Empire will change fundamentally in its organization, its structure. It will become more bureaucratic. The army supposedly will increase in size. The bureaucracy increases with it. It becomes more, much more regimented. You change from the era of Augustus and his immediate successors where the emperor was supposed to be the first among equals and would wander through the streets of Rome and be approached, would pretend to be just a senior magistrate until you move into the much more um, rigid ceremonial of a later court where items of dress mark out rank within the court, particularly of the emperor, where you can be executed for owning a, a purple tablecloth because that's suspected of being um, imperial ambitions, where you have, you know, Amianus has this wonderful description of its um, Constantinus II, I think, if memory serves, riding into Rome and not looking to either side, not acknowledging the, the cheers of the crowd, being almost statue-like. And, you know, he singles out, he didn't even scratch his nose in one of those odd little throwaway lines that makes you realise the things that were considered polite and impolite um, or normal by Roman standards that, again, they don't normally talk about. So, for a lot of the late Romanists, the Sasanian Persians have to be very different, they have to be more threatening, they have to be more dangerous. But if you think closely about it, and we'll deal with this a bit more as we go on, they control the same empire. They are not invaders that take over and change the population. Most of the people who live within this empire, these lines continue. Most of the communities continue. And it's quite striking that many of the most important Parthian noble families, like the Suren, the Karen, the Miran, continue right the way through. They last all the way through within their same tribal areas they control in, under the Parthians, and they continue under the Sasanians. Many of them will continue for a long time afterwards under the Caliphate. And they keep their own language. They keep their own names. They keep, we know this from preserved seals, from Sasanian documents. They also remain the army leaders. They keep, they act as they have... It's always difficult to use a word. People get tempted. In the older books, you'll find referring to the Parthian and Sasanian Empire as to some extent feudal and then you go and talk to medievalists and they get terribly upset about that sort of word these days and what you should actually mean by this but this is it's worth remembering the title of the king of kings whether parthian or sasanian is pointing out a very clear fact this is not the great king who rules everybody this is a king of other kings of other kingdoms even within the regional kingdoms there tend to be smaller royal groups that go and that's probably the roots of where the Sasanians have come from. They're a very successful family that managed to go higher and higher, but they win the civil war to overthrow the Arsacid Parthian dynasty because they get the backing of many of the big Parthian noble families, who, as I say, continue to run their heartlands just as they have before. So basically, this is the same empire just under a different dynasty. And in most cases, we would not see this as such a fundamental break. Now, there are changes, certainly, but it's not always easy to know whether these are changes that were gradual evolutions rather than a sudden reformation because you've got somebody coming in, a new dynasty who wants to do things their way. And again, you have to be careful with the Greek and Roman sources, but somebody like Ammianus Marcellinus, who has served as an army officer, has taken part in campaigns against the Sasanians himself, actually talks about them as Parthians time and claims that the same family is still ruling as always has. And that's normally dismissed, but from a Roman perspective, this is very much the same neighbor, rival, sometime enemy, often someone who you, you can get along with. And that's what this story is about. So um, let's just talk about the sources. As I've mentioned, the problem you have when you come to look at anything in the Roman period is that nearly all the information comes from a Roman perspective. And obviously, most of the written histories are in Greek or in Latin. Later on, you'll get Syriac and the other languages as we go on into the 7th century AD and you know, the later periods. There's very little from the other side. And that means that in most areas of the Roman Empire, you can't tell the story of what it was like when the Romans arrived from, say, the perspective of people who were living in Britain or Spain or North Africa. The sources aren't there. 
Now, we have some traditions that come through in Armenia. They come through into the later Arabic historians that talk about this period, but they are written much, much later. And they tend to, as with most sources over time, they develop to tell a story that is convenient politically for the period when they're written rather than necessarily the period they're talking about. Even with all of those, there is nothing like the detail of the Greco-Roman perspective. So we don't get a full 50-50, this is the Roman side, this is what the Parthians and Persians are thinking and saying. At no point can you do that. And similarly, the Greek and Roman tradition sets up a lot more inscriptions. So epigraphically, while there is some material, because you do have Greek cities that are doing their thing, like Seleucia on the Tigris, that is one of the biggest Greek cities in the world and is Parthian and Persian um, throughout this period. They set up some inscriptions, but far fewer have survived. And it's, this is something that while we have cumulatively large numbers of inscriptions from all over the Roman Empire, actually when you look closely you will realise that by period and region it's often very patchy. There are some areas that are covered and you know we don't generally get the inscriptions that were just painted on a wooden board. We get the lumps of stone that someone's carved and that have survived and have not been reused in a way that destroys the text on them. So we get a little bit of that, but we don't get very much. And archaeologically, partly because of um, the areas where settlement was, but also just styles of building and this sort of thing, there is much that is quite hard to date in the, on the Parthian and Persian side. So we get some sources, and we get, famously, there's the um, triumphal inscription of Shapo I, talking about his great victories over the Romans, and sculptures as well that go with them, showing him humiliating, defeating two or three Roman emperors, depending on the, the particular carving. So we get that, and there is a tendency to say, whoopee, we've got something that's not Roman. Someone actually, the other side, telling their story, the, the, the bit we're not familiar with, we do have to approach those sources with exactly the same degree of scepticism as we'd approach a Roman source. So you can compare Augustus in his Reis Gestae, you know, talks about envoys coming from India and rather implies that India is somehow part of the Roman Empire because he's so great. When Shapo I talks about the vast size of Roman armies he defeated, we might want to teach, treat it with the same pinch of salt. This is somebody telling you how great they are. And they're a politician, they are not... Um, they haven't just taken an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know, the, a degree of exaggeration is to be expected. This is the approach that I've tried to adopt, is while I have to admit from the start that I'm going to be telling this story more from the Roman side than from the Parthian and Persian side, nevertheless, you need to ask the same questions of each side and look at each empire, try and see how it develops, try and see how it works, try to see what individual leaders are aiming to do, how well they achieve that, treat them with the same, ask the same questions, even when you can't necessarily get a firm answer because the sources aren't there. And although you know, books like this I write, I hope they are academically respectable, but they are meant to pay the bills and pay the mortgage, so they are meant to reach a wider audience. The aim is to be able to explain a situation to someone who doesn't know anything about the subject before they pick it up, but is interested enough to pick it up. So there will be controversies that scholars will very rightly go into far more detail on, which I cannot afford to do, because otherwise this book would be far, far longer. I think you could effectively write a book on every chapter of this book without any trouble at all. It would not strain you too much, and probably more in some cases, because there are many aspects of detail, and when you come to interpretation of a particular archaeological site or a particular source, then there are all sorts of issues there. So you have to admit, but that's one of the most important things that as any historian, but particularly looking at the ancient world, can do for a popular audience as well as the academic audience, is admit there are things we don't know. There are questions we can ask, but we cannot reach an answer. But it's still worth considering some of the likely possibilities, but making it absolutely clear that is what you are doing. It would be wrong if at any point I, think I get to the 
point where I say, well, I think I know what the Emperor Trajan was doing and thinking or what Khosrow II was thinking, and therefore this is what he does as if it was fact, as if we had some basis to this beyond supposition. Because something that's also important to remember is that even from the Greco-Roman perspective, the sources for much of this story are very poor. Anyone will know when they study ancient history that you have the particular texts that survive. You have periods where you know, the, the first century BC is dominated by Cicero because he wrote so much that has survived. And you've got Caesar and you've got the poets and this other stuff. But you have a period where you know a lot more and you can argue in more detail about events, about details of a law, about people's personality, whatever it might be. Even the chronology can come down to on which day did this happen or this week. Whereas you come to other periods like the second century AD, critical period for relationship between the two empires, when the Emperor Trajan launches a major expedition, he turns Armenia into a province, he then advances deep into Parthian territory. You've later got the big war, another expedition by Lucius Verus, the um, co-ruler with Marcus Aurelius, and then Septimius Severus at the end of the century. Three major conflicts, complete break from what's happened before, and we know next to nothing about any of them. The sources are abysmal. We know that once there were quite detailed narrative histories written at the time. And in fact, we have Lucian the satirist has um, you know, his book, How to Write History, which lampoons all the terrible histories that he claims were being written about Lucius Verus's campaign. The scary thing is that scholars trying to reconstruct the narrative of that war have actually gone to Lucian to try and take factual details from the bits where he's making a joke. That shows just how badly off we are for information. So there are lots of big questions, even from the Roman side, where we really don't know what's going on, and we have to be honest about that. So let's first of all say, um, as I say, yeah, oh, right, yes, one more point that, um, yes, is important, because I think it's one of the main themes of the book, is that it's very easy when you're looking at this, and it is, to an extent, it's, it's rivalry, it's the relationship between these two major powers. And just like the Romans, the Parthians and the Sasanian Persians were not in direct contact with anyone else who was anything like as sophisticated or strong or united or large as they were. So in each case, the other empire is unique in the experience of, of that one. Because otherwise, you are there in a world where everyone has a much more local focus of power. It's tribes, it's little kingdoms, it's chieftains, it's very loose organizations, which can be dangerous and unpredictable, but they're probably not ever going to be strong enough to be a huge threat that might destroy you. The other empire you look at and think, oh, yeah, actually, you know, these people, they're big, they're powerful. There are limits to what we can do in our relationship with them. And part of this story is about the limits that seem to be imposed by each side on themselves. But another big mistake would be to see it just as a rivalry between two empires because there are lots of people involved in the story that are not formally part of either empire. And even within those regions, both empires at different periods have allies of considerable importance and who are effectively autonomous locally. Now, Armenia, the kingdom there, is always the land that's caught between the two big empires. And sometimes it is more under the influence of one, sometimes of the other. It maintains a degree of independence for much of the period until later on when it's it's carved up into provinces. It is an area that is actually very difficult for the kings of Armenia to control and unite because of the nature of the country and the society. But you also have other kingdoms. Again, remember for the Parthian, for the Persians, this is a king of kings. Regions are broken down into local dynasties, areas that are ruled by people you cannot fully control. Now, it's a big mistake to see these as pro-Roman, anti-Roman, pro-Persian, anti-Persian, whatever it might be. But that's the natural tendency to do, but it's a big mistake. Because you then just reduce them to a level of being subordinate. Now, okay, they are smaller. They are not people who can afford to fight and expect to defeat the empire on their own, either of them. But they are people who are quite strong locally and who can also play off one empire against the other. And that's a continual theme. The main thing to emphasize is that they are active players in their own right. 
And whether you're the king of Osrin or Armenia or leaders in the, the tribes that will become the Arab peoples, whatever it might be, you have ambitions, agendas, needs, fears of your own, and you are pursuing that politically. And in many cases, you have local rivals, whether it's um, other kingdoms nearby. Some of the big conflicts between the Romans and the Parthians or Persians begin when a king allied to one attacks a king allied to the other. And neither of them seem to want this to happen, but there's a degree to which you have to protect someone with, to whom you have an obligation. But again, don't reduce these to just simple, you know, make it the sort of arithmetic of the Cold War, where essentially you're on one side or the other, and maybe you might flip, but basically um, it's all about what the big player wants. That is not how this story works. These people are very active in their own right. So let's actually look at what didn't happen in all this 700 plus years of rivalry. Because really, when you look at it, to a great extent to my surprise, because I've looked at bits of this before, but I've never looked at the whole thing, no one makes much attempt to inflict a serious terminal defeat on the other empire. Now, we can go back and whenever any Roman leader looks even vaguely towards the Euphrates or beyond, there'll be somebody who'll start talking about Alexander the Great. There is that memory of the King of Macedon who went from northern Greece into Asia Minor and ended up having carved through Achaemenid Persia all the way in what's now Pakistan. People talk about Alexander, it's in the Roman, well, the Hellenistic and then particularly the Roman period where the idea of him as the great, as this great general, great hero is emphasized more and more. I mean, the man was uh, uh, um, building his own myth as he went along, but nevertheless, it develops more afterwards. So although they talk about this sort of thing, but the same as you'll get, the poet Horace will talk about, you know, Augustus will become a god when he's added the, the Britons and the Parthians to, to our rule. Augustus doesn't do either of those things. But actually, when you narrow it down, apart from at the very end in the 7th century AD, which we'll, we'll come on to um, in a few minutes, no one pushes the other too far. These are wars fought with very clear limits as to what you want to achieve. And they are wars that end with negotiation, but they are also wars where negotiation is frequent. In most of the campaigns where there's any sort of detailed narrative, embassies go back and forth at least once a year and often more often than that. Now, bear in mind in the ancient world, it is a rare thing. You, know, you don't have the concept of permanent embassies, of permanent contact. You wait until you've got something to say before you actually get in touch with um, another, another state, another leader. But even if you look at Crassus in 54, 53 BC, the first Roman to fight the Parthians in any meaningful way, Again, there's talk of Alexander, there's talk of him. He claims to be, he wants to dictate terms in um, Seleucia and, you know, famously is told, hair will grow on the palm of my hand before you see Seleucia. And, of course, it's, it's all a horrible disaster, as we'll, we'll see in a moment. But actually, you look at his army, you look at the length of his command, he doesn't seem to have much greater ambition than to intervene in an ongoing Parthian civil war, which, unfortunately for him, ends before he gets there. And really what he's doing is quite similar to Caesar's activity in Gaul. It's wanting to find local leaders that you can make an ally and therefore will give you what you need in terms of some tribute, supplies, this sort of thing, add to your prestige. You are not looking at permanent conquest or occupation. And bear in mind, for all the, the time that has passed, because of Alexander, educated Greeks and Romans do have some idea of just how big the Persian Empire is. People can often be rather naive, scholars, when they look at ancient concepts of space, of geography and maps, and forget some of these basic things. They, they have a tradition. The Seleucids have occupied a large part of this territory for the best part of two centuries. People know something about this. They don't imagine that it is this easy thing to walk to the ends of the world. Now, what Julius Caesar was planning to do before he was murdered is, of course, shrouded in all the propaganda of the, the years that followed his assassination, where... The liberators are saying, well, we had to kill him. And then people like Antony Augustus are saying, no, you shouldn't have done that. He was a great man. He was going to do all these wonderful things. Antony's campaign, lots of propaganda about how great it was going to be, his ambitions, this vast army. He was going to march here, there, and everywhere. Again, distorted by Augustan propaganda because you've got the civil war that will lead to Actium coming along very soon. And Augustus needs to present Antony as a failure. Now, Antony's campaign was a failure. 
and it was badly managed because he's someone who has not really had much experience of leading big armies. But nevertheless, it's, um, it doesn't seem to be a serious attempt to conquer the empire or to destroy the Parthian Empire. They don't seem to do it. Even right at the beginning, when they're feeling each other out, they don't really know just how strong these people are. Neither side, in the same way the Parthians in 4140 BC sweep into Syria, Palestine, that area, they occupy Jerusalem, or at least they send um, troops to help one of the factions in a Jewish civil war occupy Jerusalem. They're swept out by the Romans fairly quickly. So there, there's an element where you could say, well, the old Seleucids had controlled everything up to Syria, Palestine, that area, but also they'd controlled Seleucia and the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. There's lots of fairly similar communities, many of them with at least a, a sense of Greek identity still going strong. You could argue that that's a more coherent unit that may be if you were thinking in terms of natural boundaries, if you want to use such terms, that should have been under the control of one or the other side. In fact, it's always divided. And part of it is always in the Roman Empire and part of it is always in the Parthian and Persian Empire. So even at this very early stage, yes, they try a few things and they're obviously feeling each other out to work out just how strong or not these people are. Because remember, both sides are aggressive empires that have got come into contact because they've expanded towards each other. The Parthians have only been pushing into the regions where they'll contact the Romans just about the time that they run into Sulla in the 90s. And then because Armenia becomes quite powerful for a short period um, in its alliance with Pontus, Parthian power actually rolls back a little bit before it recovers and retakes some of these areas. So they're, they're working each other out and they're both peoples who are used to being sort of the biggest kid on the block. They are able to defeat anyone they come up against. And it is a bit of a shock when they first encounter someone else who's also very good at fighting and very strong and very determined. So that's what didn't happen, is that they don't try to conquer each other. And the wars fought are very limited. They're also not that frequent, at least for substantial periods. Now, what did happen? Crassus, the ally, political ally of Julius Caesar and Pompey, who had... Um, the man who defeated Spartacus in 71 BC. He is the first Roman commander to lead an army against the Parthians. He encounters a Parthian, after initial success, he encounters a Parthian army at a place called Carhai, or near there, 53 BC. The Roman army is defeated, it retreats. Most of the army is destroyed. Crassus himself is killed while negotiating with the Soren, the, the leader of one of these Parthian clans, the commander of the army at this period. Again, one of these clans that goes right the way through. We don't know his individual name. This is a famous encounter. It's the first meeting between the legionary who stands on his two feet and carves out the empire with his short stabbing gladius sword and the Parthian horse archer, agile, um, subtle in the way he fights, someone who's willing to shoot you from a distance with great accuracy with his powerful composite bow, to run away when he's pressed but then come back. He's fighting on his own terms. Clash between two different military systems, two different military cultures. And does this explain why the Romans will never go on to conquer the Parthians? People read an awful lot into the Battle of Carhai that uh, probably cannot be supported by the evidence. One really striking thing that again came to me as I was doing the book, we have a couple of accounts, principally Plutarch, a rather more confused version in Dio, of the Battle of Carhai, so that's 53 BC. The next battle between the Romans and the Parthians or Persians that is described in any detail at all is in the 6th century AD and is described by Procopius. So you've got centuries where there are some major wars and there are battles that one side wins or the other side wins, and we don't know why or how. So Carhai gets used to prove all sorts of um, great ideas when in fact it probably doesn't deserve to be treated in that way. In the main, because it's the first encounter when neither side knows how the other fights, it's also, if you look and if you follow, Plutarch's narrative is, by his standards, remarkably logical. A lot of stuff is very weird. The idea is, well, the Romans can't, they just can't catch Parthian horse archers. And the, the quintessential Parthian warrior for a Roman audience for a long time is a horse archer. You know, they've got the famous Parthian shot where he'll turn around, shoot behind him. So even when he's running away, he can still kill you. 
and he, you know, he's only pretending to run away because he's, again, he's fighting you on his terms. He's not standing toe to toe like a good brainless Greek or Roman who just likes to bash each other at close range. He's being clever, which is just not sporting when all said and done. That's, there is that element of the encounter, but if you look at the battle, what actually happens is initially a degree of stalemate. The Parthians think they can just ride the Romans down, realize they can't. Because again, these Parthians are too young to have remembered fighting the Seleucids. They haven't fought a heavy infantry army before, any more than the Romans have really fought an army like the Parthians. So neither side knows how the other works. Publius Crassus, Crassus's son, then hairs off and drives away most of the Parthian army that retreats ahead of him, and he is then surrounded and destroyed. Okay, so that shows again, it's the Parthians being smart, the Romans being dumb, group of Romans charges off, thinks that the enemy are retreating when they're not, they're just luring you onto ground of their own choosing. But if you look at the detail, Publius Crassus has not only cavalry, Gauls and Germans principally, he also has 3,000 legionaries who are going on foot. He has time to disappear out of sight of Crassus's army. He has time to send back a succession of messengers, most of whom get intercepted until the last one, asking for help while his father sits there on a hill and waits to see what's happening, not knowing, not seeing anything. So there are clear, clear errors of judgment from the Roman point of view by Crassus, who is not that experienced a commander and is also facing a situation he's never operated in this area before. He has no real idea. So there are mistakes on both sides. There are reasons why the, part, the Romans lose this battle so badly, particularly once Publius Crassus kills himself, the Parthians behead him, they parade his head around, Romans despair. Crassus has a brief moment of doing what a good Roman general should in the face of adversity, which is to pretend nothing's happening and it's all going to be fine and just we're still going to win. But then he, he, his nerve seems to break. They get pursued. Most of the Roman casualties are suffered when the Roman army retreats. Now, an army that's mostly on foot and has lots of wounded and baggage, running away from a load of horsemen is probably a bad idea. But Dio tells us, now, okay, Dio's account is confused, that Within a couple of days, the Parthians are actually running out of ammunition. They don't have arrows left. And that's one of the reasons they're willing to negotiate. Now, Plutarch famously tells us that the Romans think they can just wait for the Parthians to empty their quivers, and then it'll all be fine. They'll have to come to close quarters, and then we can duff them up. And that Seren has been very clever because he's sort of a train of camels bringing supplies of more arrows. But just think in practical terms. Arrows are big and bulky. You only need to go to medieval court records of English armies heading off to France in the Hundred Years' War. The emphasis placed on the, the amount of ammunition you needed, because one thing a good archer can do is shoot lots of arrows very quickly. So even if you've got enough to keep going for a battle and for a few skirmishes in the next few days, it's not infinite. There is a limit. There's a, a, basically, you can fight for so long, and then you've got to think about negotiating, which is what they do. And whether it's deliberate, whether it's confusion, as with so many culture clashes in these sorts of high, um, highly nervous situations, Crassus is killed. But in the years to come, several Parthian armies will be badly defeated by Roman armies in Syria. We don't really know how. The accounts are appallingly bad. And when it goes on, as I say, we don't know what's going on. But Whilst Mark Antony will lead this major expedition, which goes badly wrong in 36 BC, again, most of his casualties occur when he retreats. And even then, the Parthians can't destroy his army. Far more people die of lack of food, disease, exposure, as they, they go through the mountains of Armenia at not a great time of year. And it's partly because Mark Antony you know, could not organize the proverbial in a brewery, basically. who put him in charge of a large army, just as in the Actium campaign, or a large fleet, and he doesn't know what to do, because he's never done it before. He doesn't have that talent. He's someone who presents himself as a great soldier, but his record doesn't suggest that there's any reality to this, at least at that higher level of command. But Augustus does not lead the major Parthian expedition the poets are talking about. And in fact, negotiates, he gets the standards back that have been captured from Crassus, from Mark Antony, and he builds a Parthian arch or remodels an existing arch to make it a Parthian arch in Rome, tells everybody the Parthians have submitted, they've said we're great, but he doesn't fight them. And for most of the first century, there are a few limited encounters. For instance, under Nero, there's a conflict mostly around Armenia that is fairly sporadic. 
And that's it. In the second century, you have these three wars I mentioned before that are very badly documented. But even if you think about that, judged optimistically, that's maybe 10 years of warfare in a century. Now, obviously, that's not good, but it doesn't suggest that these two empires are at loggerheads. Things will change in the third century AD. And of course, for the late Romanists and everyone who's saying the Roman Empire has got to change and modify at this point. Oh, have I run out of my time? No, OK, I'll just have a couple more minutes so I can can cover about six centuries in two seconds. I'm sure that's possible. Um, the Sasanians have overthrown the Arsacid dynasty that has ruled for 450 years. That's a big, big deal. And they've got to prove themselves to be legitimate because we know that the Sasanians are going to rule for 400 years after this and that until the very end, there'll be nobody from outside the royal line that will ever be nominated as king or crowned as, proclaimed as king of kings. But they don't know that in the early third century. Again, hindsight can always be there to, to confuse us. Ardashir the I and Shapur the I have become the monarch through overthrowing, through leading a successful military rebellion. So they've got a good army. They're good at fighting. And the Romans are busy tearing themselves apart. So it's a really good time to go and fight the Romans. It's a good time to emphasize your power, your success, your legitimacy by going and humiliating an empire that you don't particularly like, but you don't want to have too much trouble with. Shapur I leads several expeditions into Roman territory, plunders lots of cities. He doesn't occupy anything. It's get the glory, take home captives, take home spoils, prove your legitimacy as king of kings. Look at what I can do. The Parthians were having trouble. They were being beaten by the Romans again and again. It shows that I have divine favor. I win because I should be king. And he is very aggressive for the early part of his reign. And then it seems to stop. And subsequent kings are nowhere near as aggressive. Now, often conflicts break out where there's a period of civil war in either empire. And you've got, again, somebody who wants to prove their legitimacy. And of course, like any war, one conflict tends to um, encourage others. Because people who do badly one time around think, well, They've got no reason to like the enemy who's just defeated them. And maybe when that enemy is weak, this is a good time to go back and set things right. But it is very patchy after that. The later third and fourth century, there's a fair bit of conflict. But by the end of the fourth century, there's very little. Most of the fifth century is peaceful. Again, these are long periods of time. Generations go past without major wars on either side. And that's not the story that particularly Romanists who emphasize the sort of Rome wanting to assert its might all the time are inclined to tell. It changes in the, the 6th century and it gets more and more frequent and even worse into the 7th century. Now, you have some odd stuff in the 7th century. You've had cases before where Parthian princes have gone to Rome, lived there, lived in the imperial household and then been sent back after a, an appeal from a faction within the Parthian Empire None of these people last as king of kings for more than a year or two. And this is usually written off as saying, well, they'd just become too Italian, too <coughs> Roman. They couldn't go back to the, the hunting and feasting culture of the Parthian Empire and be accepted. Probably more realistically, it would be difficult to go back into a situation where you understand the politics, the relationships between the different lesser kings, the different clan leaders, and just the way the communities, the power struggles within your own empire, because you don't know this. If you've spent most of your life living in Italy, you won't live and breathe the political life of the empire in the same way that um, someone who's been there all the time might. But also, we should point out, there are plenty of Parthian kings who grow up locally and don't last very long on the throne before somebody overthrows them because they're not very good at it. And it's a dangerous time. It's a fiercely competitive job. But in the um, late 6th century, you have um, this strange situation where Khuzro II is, faces a rebellion within the, the Persian Empire, flees to the Romans, and the Roman Emperor Morris gives him Roman troops to, and money, as well as... Um, uh, allowing he's, he's also got Persian allies, he goes back and he reclaims his throne. So you've actually had a Roman emperor where the Persian king of kings is referring to the Roman emperor as his father. Now there's been lots of a move towards in the diplomacy, they start to talk of each other as brothers and they see them. Each side basically sees the other as a not quite as good version of itself. So 
each empire naturally sees itself as the center of the world, and the other empire is quite civilized. It has the rule of law, it has reasonably good law, it, it's, it, it is organized, it's wealthy, it's just not us. You know, it's not quite as good as us. We are better, we are the true center of the world, and this, um, the others, but the other is the next best thing to all the other tribes and peoples that are just savage that are out there. However, the Emperor Morris is subsequently murdered by um, a Roman rival, and Kuzro II embarks on a war that he claims at the start is vengeance for his father, the man who put him back in power. But it's only at this period that things change because he stops negotiating. When the Romans try and send envoys, they're either imprisoned or killed. But over the course of more than a decade, he starts to take all the Roman border front um, fortresses and then he starts to take Roman territory, not simply go in, humiliate the Romans, emphasize Persian strength and just say, look, you need to form a treaty that sh accepts the fact that we are important, we need to be treated with respect and you need to pay us some money, which is how most wars have ended up until then. Instead, you go in and you start to occupy Syria, you occupy Palestine, you occupy Egypt. All of this falls partly because the Romans are busy fighting a civil war of themselves, which, you know, amongst themselves, which has been a hobby since the third century, but also... <coughs> The Persians gain momentum. They gain, they start to believe, but they, are, they become more ambitious. Now, it's probably a gradual process, and Khosrow might start out with far more limited ambitions and then start to think, well, actually, I'm doing really well. Maybe the Romans are weaker than I feared. Let's push it a bit further and a bit further and see what happens. <coughs> Unfortunately, this crucial period is very, very poorly documented. So if we had, say, a Procopius or an Ammianus for these years we would probably be talking about what's happening season to season. Instead, you know, we're vaguely working out, okay, he seems to run over on Egypt about this time. There is in um, 626, when a Persian army is at the Dardanelles, it can see Constantinople, but it can't cross, and allies they've made from the Avars, who've come sort of through, well, modern day Bulgaria, that area, through besiege Constantinople, look as if they're going to take it, but the city manages to hold out. The Persians and the Avars are never able to cooperate in practical terms, but that's the only time, really, in all this history, where it looks as if one empire will destroy the other, and it doesn't quite happen. And by this time, Heraclius, who's made himself Roman emperor, leads a fight back, which is quite small scale, and Khosrow seems to be suffering from, he's, he's just stretched himself too thinly, he hasn't got the money, the manpower anymore, he suffers some defeats, and the Romans win, Persian generals start to turn against him, there's a coup, and he's overthrown. And this is how the war ends, with the Romans again backing somebody else as king of kings who doesn't last very long before he's murdered. But you have um, then by this period where essentially it ends up going back to how things were before. The, the Persians agree to vacate the provinces of the Roman Empire they've taken, and the Romans will reoccupy them. There are Roman troops helping to restore the new king of kings. There's a period of a lull where it seems to have sort of reset to how it was before. But then a few years later, you have the, again, from our perspective, sudden, um, but the eruption is almost a, a good word, the appearance of the armies of Islamic Arabs who will spread very quickly. And within a matter of years, in critical year being 636, the Romans suffer a serious defeat. The Sasanians suffer a serious defeat. Within a matter of years, the Romans lose all the territory that they'd lost quite recently. The Sasanians becomes under Arabian rule. The Persian Empire ceases to exist. Some of the last Sasanians who are recorded end up at the court of the Chinese emperor as a sort of, you know, what's Bonnie Prince, Prince Charlie type figure. There's one who is briefly back, tries to recover the lost territory, but he can't do it. But one of them we, is recorded serving as a general in the Chinese army. Um, so the family does survive. Many people, as they've done before when the Sasanians have appeared in the first place, change sides. So the Karen, the Suren, the Miran, these families survive for generations, but they just accept a new ruler and they are pretty much allowed to do their own thing in their homeland. The Roman Empire will go into um, survives but it loses not only those eastern provinces in time during the course of the 7th century, North Africa will go as well. And you know, eventually you'll have the, the Muslim armies coming into Spain. So the world changes profoundly, apparently suddenly, 
Although again, remember, because the sources are poor, we'll often say, well, this thing, this, this happened over two, three years. And forget that in somebody's actual life, two or three years is quite a long time. And if we had better sources, we'd tell this story rather differently. But it is still remarkably quick. The, the sort of traditional way of looking at it is to say, well, you've fought yourselves to exhaustion and along comes a new opponent who is well-organized, well-motivated, skillful, probably not particularly numerous, but they're good at what they do. And you, you're not prepared for this and you just collapse very, very quickly. Might be a bit more complicated than that, but that's, that's another really big issue. Now, I'm sure that's well over 45 minutes, so I probably ought to, to stop at that point and we better get to questions, otherwise I'll be told off. Um, yeah. Firstly, Adrian, you will definitely not get told off. Um, what I'll do, um, I'll ask the first question to get things going and then we'll take questions. Are we using a microphone for the questions? We are using a microphone for the questions. So before you put your hands up, I'll ask the first question. I want to take you right back to the very beginning of the Parthian uh, occupation of the Tigris and Euphrates valleys. So the Parthians ultimately conquered the majority of the former Seleucid Empire. When they did so, did they obliterate the Seleucid Empire or did they take it over as a going concern? And if the latter, is there any evidence of osmosis of Hellenistic culture into the Parthian world? It's, I mean, you've got to remember the Seleucids haven't just changed everything. You know, they take a fragment of Alexander's empire, but most communities still run their own day-to-day -day affairs. There are Greek colonies, there are Greek, you know, consciously Greek cities, but there are lots of others as well that are part of the system. And some of the regions you lose, you recover, you know, you have... The Parthians have, they never managed to capture a Roman emperor, unlike the Sasanians, but they do capture and kill some um, Seleucid kings. And you have um, a situation where, in a sense, the, the Parthians almost begin as, as a rebellious provincial fringe area to the Seleucids, and then they expand beyond that. Other people are doing the same. There are kingdoms that are coming from the south as well as from the north that fight each other. So it's, it's quite complicated. You can just about trace it, but on the whole, they seem to do what most successful empires do in the ancient world, is they actually just want people to submit to them. And as long as you do that, things will stay as they are. And because most of the administration is done at city level or regional level, rather than as an empire-wide thing, a lot of it does survive, but again, there are big problems. There's, you know, we know less about the Seleucids than we'd like to as well. And compared to, say, Macedonia or let alone Ptolemaic Egypt, we know less about them. There are lots of puzzles, and particularly about how things actually work in the regions that are less Greek. So I would think on the whole, whoever it is, whether it's the Romans, whether it's the Parthians, the Sasanians later on, they don't get these empires accidentally. They get it because they're very good at dominating and using military force, but also using politics and diplomacy to control people, to convince them that it's worth supporting you and accepting you rather than rebelling, because the price of rebellion is terrible, but also the price of living under you isn't that bad. Yeah. So there is a lot of continuity. And you look at, I mean, there's the, a marvelous story that Josephus, the, the Jewish historian, tells about these two brothers from the Jewish community of Babylonia under the Parthians who run away from their apprentices, they run away from a master and they turn bandit. And then they end up, after fighting some of the local noblemen, the king of kings actually accepts one of them as his regional representative. So you sort of have this progression from being an outlaw to, okay, well, if you're the one who can control this area, fine, that's fine by me. Long as you do what I say, don't do anything I don't want you to do. All of these regions that, that in the ancient world, this sort of thing tends to happen more because it, it's the only way, it's the only practical way. None of these empires are strong enough to control everything locally all the time. The Romans take that further than most. They will impose direct rule over an ever wider area. They'll intervene at more of a, um, a lower level. But um, for the, and the Sasanians to an extent are, at least have left more trace of an organized bureaucracy, to some extent an organized religious system as well, or sort of hierarchy anyway. Um, though again, that might be more a reflection of how the sources we have and how we look at them. 
Um, one of the big problems, and it's, it's a huge problem militarily, is that we, as I said earlier, we don't know what's, what's happening and we know next to nothing about the Parthians. If we know little about the Romans in the second century AD, we know nothing at all, really, very little indeed about the Parthians. And whether they are the same Parthians that we read rather more about in the first century BC, or whether, after all that passage of time, their state has developed. So how many things that are innovations, apparently that are usually attributed to the Sasanian kings, have actually been pottering along and are a logical progression of something where someone's worked out, this works, so let's do that. In the same way that much of the information about what Sasanian kings do comes from quite late and tends to be projected back to earlier periods rather than allowing, again, the Sasanian dynasty rules for 400 years. A lot can happen in that time. The political balance can change, the way you administer. And sometimes it might be that what we think of as a later innovation, that suddenly you have a king with much more control or a king of kings, is actually just what always happens when you have a strong king of kings who is more secure politically, who is more dominant, and therefore people listen to what he's doing and he has more influence on what happens in the regions. When that king of kings is weak for whatever reason, whether personality, whether the political balance, then it looks as if this empire is much more regionalized, localized in the way things work. So we've got to allow for those possibilities as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Right, let's throw it open. So, gentlemen here. Um, thank you very much for coming to Oxford to give your talk. Um, uh, when I was at school, most of my history was kings and queens, battles, and, and a lot of Romans. Um, but you, and most, I know you have focused on conflict, um, and the history has to be written down to be recorded. But, and you've also said that there was actually long periods without any conflict. Could you say a bit more about the need, you know, the trade between um, the two regions and actually exchange of culture, exchange of trade when they're not fighting? And obviously that isn't necessarily written down, but it might be discovered through architecture and stuff like that. So, and would it be possible for the Romans, for example, to have any exchange with um, India? Clearly they would have had to have gone through territory. So how easy it would have been for somebody to pass through the territories when they're not at war? Um, quite easy, um, you, and you would be aware of it. I've got a chapter on focusing on trade, and it comes in at various periods, because it, it's a fascinating subject. You do have, the, the Ptolemies have developed using the monsoon winds to sail from the Red Sea ports of Egypt to Sri Lanka and to India, and there are trading settlements of each in either, at either end of it. Obviously, a lot of stuff is coming over land, the Silk Road is always a misnomer because it's, it's several different routes. It's very interesting. There are some fascinating Chinese sources about early contact with the Parthians, where one of their main concerns is what, what produce do these people have? What do they sell? There's even, they're one, one point described as, as very shrewd at business. You know, you sort of, these, these aren't people you could... But, um, and there's a slightly strange bit where, Again, it shows how cultural assumptions work. The Chinese assume that rice is always going to be your basic crop, even though that's not true of most of the areas they're talking about. But it's just, they think, well, surely that's what you do. But they are pushing forward, and that's, there, there are periods where, depending on how successful, how strong China is at the time, it gets nearer. But there are goods going from there. You have, obviously, silk. You have... Um, the, many of the spices and other things are coming from Arabia, but there are lots of goods coming through. S the Chinese had developed more sophisticated methods, or at least more reliable methods, of smelting steel, rather than the sort of slightly more hit and miss and craftsman way of doing it you, you have in the Roman Empire. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But, and that's in demand, and Parthian noblemen and Persian noblemen would like to have weapons or armour of Chinese steel. Uh, but steel is obviously damned heavy, so it's very difficult to transport. An awful lot happens. It's coming by sea, it's coming by land. The Parthians do very well as middlemen in the process, A, because it gives them first access to goods that they want as well, but also anything that's passing through your land you can charge a toll on. And the Romans are doing the same. A few Roman authors talk with sort of great concern about the amount of money that's going out of the empire to India and to the east to buy all these luxuries. Pepper, again, another you know, thing they, they develop. A trip. And silk, which in Caesar's day is fairly exotic, it's a luxury of the few, becomes more and more common. 
there is a tendency because a lot of the more spectacular stuff as we see it comes from China, from India, from beyond into the Roman Empire. It comes from east to west. But actually, commerce being commerce, you're not going to go empty the other direction. And there are things that are exotic from the point of view of an eastern market. Now, there are probably very few people who travel all the way from the Roman Empire to China and everything in between. A lot of this is in stages. So again, more people are making money at different points along the route. But you will get amber coming from the Baltic through the Roman Empire and ending up as a symbol of rank in the Chinese court. Um, Roman trained um, acrobats, jugglers, this sort of thing. Well, the slaves were highly prized in China as well. Um, there's even that very weird situation you get in later antiquity where silk is imported from China, it goes to workshops in Antioch and other places in Syria, and it's rewoven to be finer, and it's dyed in using processes that the Romans knew about, the Chinese didn't, and then it's sold back to China, who believed that Westerners had their own type of silkworm. Because obviously they're guarding that secret very clearly, and it's not until really late in our period that monks smuggle silkworms out of China. But it's, it's, again, it shows human ingenuity. When people see the chance to make money, they will do it. And they'll work things out. So it's, it's a complex thing. You will find this influencing some of the, the conflicts. Um, another fascinating, I haven't got time to go on about it, is Palmyra, the, the city which makes its, its, its wealth really on providing armed escorts for caravans going through the desert from Roman territory into Parthian. And neither empire seems to mind these armed bodies of, of soldiers effectively because it's serving a useful purpose. So there's a lot going on, that's an important part. They are trading, they are exchanging ideas. You know, certainly in, in fiction, in some of the late traditions, everybody believes you could travel very widely and very easily. Um, and part that is a reflection of the success of each empire, that they provide the stability and safety that you can travel in ways that it's, when you've got lots of different regional powers, it's much more difficult. So yes, it's, it's a big, big thing. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Gentleman at the back. Hello, thank you, Dr. Goldsworthy, for your talk. I wonder whether you could touch more on the very intriguing point that you mentioned a few times, uh, the lack of sources, in particular with respect to Septimius Severus, because for a, I'm a student of theology, and for me, I have everything that I need for, for his reign. Um, so even Tertullian has three texts that mention what it's like to serve in the military under him and what it's like to be a husband under his reign, even if you're pagan, and so forth. So what, uh, what text would you hope to see for his reign? It would be nice to have the equivalent, even you know, get Cassius Dio, he's a senator writing in the third century, writing a history up to the present day, but most of it only survives in later epitome. So it's written, it's, it's basically pared down by Byzantine authors centuries later and very, very vague. It would be nice to have, I mean, we don't know to what extent Trajan wrote anything about his Parthian campaigns, but we know he wrote commentaries on Dacia, of which only a single sentence has survived. Now, whether they were the sort of length of Caesar's commentaries, that would be nice. It would be nice to have some battle accounts. It would be nice to have more sense of what's the politics. You know, the... The sources as we have them are a bit confused as to why Trajan goes and suddenly attacks Armenia. Um, with Lucius Verus, that's in response to a Parthian attack into Cappadocia, Roman territory, but we don't know why are they doing that. Now, the odds are these things don't come from nowhere. There, are, there will be causes of friction that lead to these conflicts. It is a reflection. I mean, as you go more and more, as you get later and later, the, um, the church literature greatly increases, and that's what people preserve, understandably, because the people who are preserving all these texts through the Dark Ages and beyond, it'll be primarily through the church. So that's great, but it, there were lots of histories being written at this time. I mean, you can never expect to get the documents that you know once existed because the chances of that sort of stuff turning up, but it would be nice just to have some basic narrative history um, where you could be sure what was happening in a year. And Hopefully, it would be nice to have it of the quality of... <laughs> I'm almost surprised to find myself saying this, of a Tacitus or um, someone like, who is clearly biased, distorts things a lot, but nevertheless provides you with a lot of detail. And people like that, the same as someone like Julius Caesar, they give enough information that you can look closely at it and think, OK, I think I know why he's saying that. Maybe this is... So it's... 
it's a change. I mean, you will find this, obviously, one of the most controversial figures, again, didn't get to mention, is the Emperor Julian from the 4th century, who is raised to be a Christian, but, you know, his, most of his family gets wiped out, ends up as emperor, and invents this really wacky religion of his own that's basically Christianity that's not Christianity, because I don't like that. But it's trying to have an organised pagan church that, as far as we can tell, he's the only person who actually believes in and thinks is a great idea. But his campaign, he marches all the way down to um, Tessaphon and Seleucia, and then marches back and gets himself killed on the way back. Um, but because of this, the tradition on him is fiercely partisan <laughs> because of who he was. But this is a major expedition that, again, gives us some detail. But you, you, it, that's, So we know more about that, but we know far less about expeditions that went there um, generations before on either side, which means the detail we have for Julian, can we be sure this is typical? Um, Ammianus Marcellinus, who, who provides the, the fullest account of this, throws in these lovely little nuggets of information. For instance, one occasion he mentions that a Roman cavalryman riding picket duty stretches out his arm with a cloak to show that enemies in sight. And that's the symbol that they knew. Now, is that that army at that time in that province, that's what they've trained to do? Or is this something the Roman army's been doing for a long time? Um, it would just be nice to know from how, how things work. But I think the first and foremost, it would be nice to have greater narrative sources. And there are lots of periods. Second century is crucial. Severus, it would be interesting, although this is the gentleman to talk to more about Severus than, than me. Um, it would be wonderful to have greater detail of those seventh century conflicts with Heraclius and just what's going on and how it changes. Um, because it is so... I mean, as I, I say, you've got the account of Carhai in 53 BC and then you're getting into the 560s before you've got a next good battlefield account. So you are... You've got these glimpses stretched apart with centuries between them, and you're trying to understand it all from that. So there is so much we don't know. And all of a sudden, there's, there's, there's loads of stuff I'd love to have. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, madam. Follow on, this is a follow-on question really about sources. Um, I was just curious if there were any non-Roman sources that you worked with that you found interesting or what are the gaps and what are your thoughts on then building up a more complete picture of the period based on that? Again, even with you know, some of those you could say, well, is Josephus Roman or not? That's interesting because he tells us about all this stuff that's um, going on and th this idea of day-to-day -day life within a different empire although within a particular community of it. Um, and there's, you know, there's the, the, uh, a little bit he talks about earlier as well, where you have a, she's described as an Italian slave, Musa, who's given by Augustus to a king of kings, ends up as his favoured concubine, and her son by him becomes the heir, and she's the only woman to appear on a Parthian coin with the son. Okay, we've only got little fragments. That would, you know, you've got this story, you've got the a little bit of epigraphy to show that this is going on, and it's something is obviously unusual in all of this. It's interesting when you look at the Arabic tradition that it heavily favours the Sasanians. And in fact, in the memory that they've managed to pass on to the Middle Ages, they reduce the length of the Parthian dynasty from about 450 years to about 200 to make them look bad. But again, it, it shows how the propaganda of a family that the, is, first of all, starting off by saying, well, look, we've got to take over because these people are terrible. You know, we are actually proper, proper kings. Um, but then over time as well, people probably forget. They conflate things. There is a lot of... The problem is much of this stuff, it ties into the, the poetic tradition as well that takes the deeds of one hero and sort of runs in lots of other... And probably you end up with an amalgam and there might be bits, but separating what is actually that. So that's interesting. I mean, the, the Palmyrians are interesting because they set up an awful lot of inscriptions. And they are this odd kingdom that just thrives. They're in the right place. They exploit a gap in the market for a while. But then you, they get caught up in a Roman civil war. Queen Zenobia is defeated. She ends up, depending on tradition, dead or married to a Roman senator and having family there as well. And that seems more likely than the, the idea. But... When you look at their inscriptions, and people are recorded as having led so many successful caravans, and that's quite interesting. The thought of this completely, it's a sort of, it's an organization, I say, that, that spans the frontiers. It goes on either side. So that, 
That's interesting because you've got this small community and you can focus and you can see they've taken on lots of Roman stuff, but they don't like public bathhouses, so they don't build any of those. And they present... They, as is the case, you can see it very clearly within the Roman Empire, and I suspect it's true in the Parthians and Sasanians as well. Often, different regions will take bits of the imperial culture that they quite like, and then decide, well, actually, we don't like that, so we'll, we'll do this aspect of our lives a different way. And again, it's a sign of the success of these empires. They let that happen. They're not bothered. They're not trying to impose their way of doing things at every level. So it's, I mean, the, the Shapur inscription is, is always fascinating because he sort of lists the places he, he defeats and he talks about, it's quite interesting. When Romans write triumphal monuments, they love listing the number of peoples they defeated and the numbers they fought. And Shapur does exactly the same, but he talks about Romans. So he claims, you know, they brought the entire Roman Empire against me and I still beat them. And he lists all these different races that probably quite possibly were represented in the Roman army. But it, it's interesting just seeing, playing exactly the same game and just, but it's, it's also frustrating because you just want more. You know, the more you get, the more you can judge how useful these sources are, how to treat them. So, and it's, it's sadly, it's not there. Patrick. Are there any Chinese sources about conflicts with Persia during this period? Not, not really, because they, they never quite get into military contact. There's always this buffer zone where they're moving further west and then the border of what's the Parthian or the Persian Empire changes. You have, for the Han Dynasty for a while, they're, they're very successful, it's centralized, then you get periods of civil war where sort of organized government retreats. But there is always the, this intriguing thing. There have been various theories about different groups that appear in Western sources as the Huns, for instance, whether these are related to nomadic peoples the Chinese are encountering, and that then the Chinese defeat, the, so they go west, that they end up they find another empire that's got money, that's got lands, and attack those. There's probably some truth in it, but it's, it's rarely as neat as people often make out because the political military balance within a lot of these steppe tribes seems pretty volatile. Um, and until you get to people like the Turks, where you have more of a sense of community um, and of sort of East and West dynasties, uh, but even that at times breaks up. So it... It's not really there. I mean, you have the story that there's a Chinese embassy that tries to get to Rome. Because in the 160s, this group of merchants arrives at the Chinese court claiming to come from the great King Antun, which is probably either Antoninus Pius or Marcus Aurelius in one of those forms. But the gifts they give are all things that have, they've picked up en route. So there's ivory and things like that. So again, it's probably a sign of people trading at different stages. And again, if you turn up, you're trying to make an impression, you want good trade concessions, say you've come from the emperor. The Chinese are at one point think about sending an embassy by sea to Rome, but they're told that it would take years and they don't bother basically. Now, people, there've been various theories. Some people have said, well, this is a group of Parthians who've said, we control the market. If we tell them how to get there and it's not really that far away, maybe that will be bad for us in the long run, there'll be competitors. Or it might be the misunderstanding. They actually thought, well, if you've got to sail around Africa, yeah, it's gonna take you a few years, um, rather than cross by land and get to the Mediterranean. Hard to say, it's, it's again, it's little fragments. That they are aware of the Romans, the Romans are dimly aware of them. The Chinese perhaps slightly more precisely, but I think that's more a reflection of the type of source that survives. Their knowledge of the Parthians, it's interesting, one of the Chinese sources actually talks about and their queens appear on their coins, which presumably ties in with that one instance of Musa where she does, because it never happens anywhere else. So somewhere in that source, someone who'd seen one of those coins has looked at that and taken it as typical. And it's, again, too far away to be really bothered about. Um, they're frightfully impressed by ostriches. Um, that's a big thing. And, and so, because again, it's the things that seem exotic to people in Parthia or to the Romans are different to the things that seem exotic. You know, amber, really valued. Um, another thing that's quite interesting is that in the later periods, you get direct competition to control the markets along the east coast of Africa. And you get developments. You can see states that are benefiting from this trade. And the Sasanians are very successful in pushing further and further south and controlling that area. It's perhaps one reason why when the Arab armies do attack, they seem to put more weight in their attacks on the, the Persians at first because there's a, there's a history of conflict because they have been dominated by the stronger kings of kings and it's sort of getting their own back time. 
but also controlling access to the, the Sasanians try and block Roman merchants from getting to India and Sri Lanka, and to some fair degree are successful in this later period. So they, they take over the trade so that they can make more from it. So it, it's there, but it's, it's slight. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, well, two here, so thank you. Um, thank you. I actually have a question about the, the Persian-Arab conflict, so probably at the tail end of the, of the period. Um, so we have some evidence of what seems like the instinctive response of the Sasanians to the, the um, conflicts within the Arab Muslim uh, movement and uh, singling out of conflicts between leaders, um, tribal uh, dissent, and um, things like that. We don't have any evidence that I'm, that I'm aware of, of any attempt at that from the Roman side. Is that absence of evidence, or do we have any indication that might be um, evidence of absence, and what does that say about the general sort of geostrategic thinking and the way that the, the both, uh, both the big empires saw the little guy coming up and and coming up to them? It could be a little bit absence of evidence, but I suspect more actually it's that the Sasanians know more about the Arabs and the Arabs know more about them, particularly the regions where this is forming. Um, it's striking. Heraclius will tell his soldiers in the campaigns he fights against the Sasanian Persians that if they die in battle, it's effectively martyrdom, that you will go to heaven. They don't do that when the Arab armies attack them. There, there, there is this sense the Romans seem incredibly complacent about this. And again, perhaps that's because we know this is going to change the map for a very long time. But also, I, just, I don't think they understand them as well as I think the Persians have, have, have a bit more sense. And it's also, this is the, the Persians are basically trying to do what they've been doing in this area and elsewhere for a long time. And it doesn't work this time. But it's that sense of, yes, let's turn one leader against another. Let's manipulate them. Let's try and break them up, find some allies. Because that's how you've controlled people in the past. The Romans don't seem to, I mean, there is a difference in that very clearly there is much more hatred on both sides between the Persians and the Arab armies initially than there is with the Romans. And one of the reasons why I think the Arab armies are so successful, I mean, the, first and foremost, you have to say anybody who conquers as much so quickly just in practical terms, is doing something right militarily. You know, they're good. These armies are well-led, well-organized, well-motivated. They might not be very big, and they do start to pick up people who have acted as allies in this big war between the Romans and the Persians. So they know the area, and there are more communities with whom you have a link so you can find your way around. So they've, they've got a lot of advantages, but there's an element where the Romans have really struggled in this war against Khosrow II, and they've had real trouble massing any sort of field army of any strength. It's basically Heraclius can lead off this, these expeditions, but that's it. There's nobody else that can go back and can try and retake any of the areas. And I think the other advantage that the, the Arabs have is that when they get to Jerusalem, say, or Alexandria later on in Egypt, this is an area where just a few years before you were occupied by the Persians and it wasn't too bad. And you did a deal with them. There was no point then dying for a Roman emperor who wasn't going to come and save you because actually you waited a few years and he did come back and it was all okay. And I think that you can see clearly in the sources the, the Arab armies are very tactful in the way they deal with these communities. They're not challenging. They are um, willing to come to terms. You even have the case of in, in, you know, one city where they agree to surrender if we're not relieved within I can't remember, a year or 18 months. And they're not, so they surrender. Fine, that's fair. And they're treated quite well. So where there seems more sign of conflict, but again, the sources for what's happening on both sides, you know, to look at the details of um, the, the defeat suffered on either side, it's actually quite hard to look at, to work out what's going on. Um, other than, generally speaking, the Arab army seem to run rings around both sides. Um, but how much that is the benefit of hindsight, people saying, well, they won, didn't they? Um, so they must have done. But I, th I think there is a difference. I think there is a lack of understanding. And probably even decades later, maybe it's because Heraclius is getting old and you have that, that inertia. The Romans don't, you know, they seem to think they'll just be able to sort this out. And, oh, yeah, we'll win in the end. I think perhaps because much of their contact with, in inverted commas, Arab 
forces before, is people who come in, raid, and go away. And I wonder if they're still thinking that way. If you look at the Strategicon, for instance, you know, late 6th century text where you're talking about how to fight different enemies, they don't even talk about the Arabs. They're not worth rating. Whereas you talk about Scythian, you know, they were, they're using all these archaic terms and sort of grouping people together very clumsily. But the Arabs are not perceived to be a big military problem we have to think about. And that's, again, not that much earlier. So I, I suspect there's, there's that element. I think that the, the Persians have, a, have had a different experience, so they, they act differently. Thank you very much. Uh, another question here. Um, could you compare or contrast the, the, the Roman idea of, of emperor and the Persian idea of king of kings, just with regard to, I don't know, constitutional powers, um, relationship to the people or relationship to the gods? It's, it's harder because, obviously, again, as always, we've got more evidence from the Roman point of view. <coughs> but that also changes. Um, the development from the idea of the princeps, you know, the uh, of Augustus, the Julio Claudians, and beyond, into the ever increasing formality to the um, the emperor as semi divine, as special, as someone, you know, instead of you go and shake hands with Augustus, he might even stand up to greet you. When you have to prostrate yourself on the floor and kiss the emperor's hem of his robe or his foot, or this or thing, it's a very different world. So that society has changed, and during this time particularly later on, obviously it's under people like Justinian where a lot of the, the legal aspect of the imperial position and indeed how the state works is being codified and brought together from all these different rulings that have been put together. I think there's a difference in the name. Obviously, King of Kings is marking himself out as the highest, but I am ruling over other kings who have rights, who have dignity. Both the Arsaces and the Sasanians are remarkable in convincing everybody that you can only be king of kings if you have that royal blood of that line. Um, the Romans never managed that. Anybody can become emperor. You know, Pertinax is the son of a freed slave. Um, and that's, you know, that's only late second century. Um, and in fact, you know, you get people like Septimius Severus and others will, will create these spurious ancestry that somehow links them to the imperial family. Other people will do it. You'll take names from, from earlier. and you'll, But it's... Everybody knows. So the Roman society is different. Rome is also, the empire is very much an empire of cities in their sort of mental map of how it worked. Yes, there are areas that don't have them, but in the main, that's how they think. Whereas the Parthian and Persian empire has cities, but it doesn't just have cities. It has lots of other communities as well. The Sasanians from the start will present themselves as representatives of you know, the divinity on earth. So they are, you know, there's this, um, you have sculpture where Ahura Mazda, the, the sort of greatest of the Zoroastrian gods, presents what's interesting is what looks like a very Greek wreath to them. So they've taken, one of the other big questions is how much the Sasanians in particular, or the Parthians know about the Achaemenid Persians. Because whilst they revive things, it's, you know, how much do people remember? It's different, it seems a different version of how the religion works. For instance, you never represented the god as basically just like a slightly bigger human in that earlier period. They do. Um, and there's a parallel where Ahura Mazda is shown trampling a demon whilst the king of kings tramples his Parthian enemy. So you, you're directly correlating this sense that I am God's representative on, on earth and I am there to protect the, the truth from the lie. You know, the, this concept and it's interesting in Shapur's um, monument of his achievements, he talks about, and the Roman emperor lied again, and therefore I have to defeat him. And he is, his father is king of the Aryans, or king of king of the Aryans, he is king of king of the Aryans and the non-Aryans, you know, I've gone even bigger. As time will go on, whilst you get third century emperors associating themselves with sun gods, this sort of thing, and a sense of, I have a special god who looks after me. With Constantine, obviously, you have a huge change but it's, there's an element of similarity. Both empires prize the rule of law and good law that is justly implemented. And the emperor or the king of kings is the person who makes that happen. And a good one ensures that it happens throughout his empire. A bad one does not. They, I mean, you have these, um, it mostly comes from Roman 
accounts of what Persian envoys are saying, talking about the two empires as the two eyes of the world, or the two lamps of the world. And it's from about 300-ish where we find from the Roman sources you start talking about the king of kings as brother. Um, now, you can't... Augustus, that's not going to happen. Bear in mind, Augustus never goes and negotiates with the Parthian in person. One of his adopted sons, his grandsons, will go and meet the... Um, the Parthian king of king, and they, they had this, these strange sort of rituals they develop where they first of all meet on a bridge with a sort of artificial island in the Euphrates, and then that's the first meeting on sort of neutral ground, and then they go, one of them entertains one night, and, the other, and, the other, and both armies parade and all this sort of thing. And there's a, a marvellous glimpse of this from Velius Paterculus, who was actually there as a tribune, mentions the, the splendour of this. You know, the, That's the closest in that period the Romans get to accepting their neighbours as, as equals. But later on, it becomes much more clear to the extent where you have in the 6th century a major war develops because the King of Kings has actually asked the Roman Emperor to adopt his, his favoured son to help his succession. And then the Roman advisors apparently say to him and say, well, look, hang on a minute, won't that give him a claim to our empire as well? You know, is, are they pulling a fast one here? And they try and then adopt him in a lesser status, which insults, understandably, the Persians who thought this was, you know, Quite, quite reasonable. And I don't think we're trying to pull a fast one or anything like that. It, it's, but that ends up with, with stimulating conflict. But it, it's, it develops to that point. As I say, I think it comes back to the key. Each one sees each other as a slightly inferior version of itself. But the details of the relationship vary. We have, for instance, there's a long inscription by a Zoroastrian high priest who claims to be high priest of high priests and claims to have taken part in Shapur's campaigns and ignited fire temples in conquered territory and this sort of thing. It seems to imply that there are, are groups there that have been Zoroastrian all the way through Roman occupation, but not proper. He has to instruct them how to do things properly. People argue that that suggests that like the, the hierarchy of the church within the Roman Empire, you have a not an equal authority, but a different authority. You know, the emperor can act at times, he can, depending on who it is, um, intervene in debates on doctrine, this sort of thing. But there is this other non, non-military, political, non-administrative structured organization. Some people have said that's happening with the Zoroastrians within the, Parthian, uh, the Persian Empire. The problem is, again, I suspect it comes back to this chapel, although he mentioned Shapur in his inscription, is actually prominent under one of um, the kings who comes later, who is very weak and who faces civil war and threats and this sort of thing. So I suspect that's when a powerful priest, a powerful courtier can become more influential, to take that as an assumption that they're always doing this. There are times where conflict is promoted in Armenia where they're trying to sort of convert people. But again, precisely what that means is, is, is hard to know. So um, short answer is no, we can't <laughs> say precisely how it works. Particularly, again, we can get much closer to how we think a Roman emperor is considered. Although, again, even with the legal framework, remember within the Roman Empire, there is an awful lot of tradition and the assumption of this is how things work, that as long as everybody accepts, it still does, that isn't necessarily formally organised. Because the Roman Empire has, has sort of happened. You know, it, it's like a lot of political systems, it's just developed along the way for political convenience of individuals and then people get used to the idea. There's probably similar stuff going on in the East as well, but we know much less about it. Fantastic. And that's time out. <laughs> so, Adrian, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. That was absolutely fantastic. Adrian Goldsworthy. <laughs>